In this video, we're going to talk about a new concept called orthogonal complements. So we have a notion of orthogonal. Orthogonal is a new word for perpendicular in any dimensional, any Euclidean space. Let's talk a minute about the word complement and how we use it in other parts of mathematics. So let's start with geometry. Uh, you may have seen complementary angles. The complement of a 40 degree angle would be a 50 degree angle because together th they will form a complete right angle. So the 50 degree angle completes the 40 degree angle to make a right angle. We also use the word complement when we're dealing with sets. So here's a simple example. Suppose our set U has seven numbers in it, 2, pi, E, 0, 1, I, and 9. And we take a subset A with the numbers E, pi, 1, and I. Well, the complement of A would be the set 0, 2, 9. The complement of A is what's needed from U to complete A to make all of U. So the complement of A completes A to make the whole set U. So now let's talk about orthogonal complements. And let's start with a plane in R3 which passes through the origin. So we'll call this plane pi. We know the plane does not span all of R3. But if I took a basis for pi and added to that a vector which sticks out of the plane a little bit, um, that would complement the basis for pi and altogether they would span R3. So we need another vector not in the plane and that's when we start thinking about this word orthogonal. So a vector which is not in the plane uh, and is orthogonal to the plane would be the normal vector. And so and we know that the equation is just the normal vector dotted with x, y, z equaling 0. And to emphasize, again, the normal vector is orthogonal to any vector in the plane pi. And the normal line, the line that passes through the normal vector and through the origin, uh, is a subspace. And it's orthogonal to pi. Well, what does it mean for subspaces to be orthogonal? That means that any vector orthogonal to plane pi is on the normal line. And any vector orthogonal to the normal line lies in the plane pi. So here, this example already gives us the key ingredients of what orthogonal complements are. Orthogonal complement, an orthogonal complement is a subspace itself. It completes, it's what's needed to complete the other subspace to make all of Rn. So in this case, the pi in the plane pi uh, needs the normal line to complete all of R3. The other thing is, is that, yeah, they are orthogonal. So those two subspaces, the line and the plane, are examples of orthogonal complements. We say they're orthogonal complements of each other because Again, the line by itself doesn't span R3. The plane pi by itself doesn't span R3. But their union, or their join, is going to be all of R3. Now, the way we write orthogonal complement is to use this little perpendicular sign as a superscript. So we say ln equals pi perp. Well, we could say that 
uh, pi is ln perp. So we, we say perp, but I honestly just say orthogonal complement. I would say the normal line is the orthogonal complement of pi. So here's our formal definition. So if we have a subspace, so we have to start off with a subspace. We can only talk about orthogonal complements of subspace. So that's why we had a plane passing through the origin that represents a subspace. If we have a subspace, then the orthogonal complement of w, which is written w perp, is the set of all vectors in Rn, which are orthogonal to all vectors in w. So again, what you should always have in mind for orthogonal complements is a plane through the origin and its corresponding normal line. So in set notation, we would write it this way. We, uh, w perp is all vectors in Rn, where the dot product with any vector in W is 0. That's our test for orthogonality. This upside down A is shorthand math notation. And I use it occasionally. It means for all. So it's probably one of the most common abbreviations. There's another upside down or backwards E. And that stands for there exists. So I don't use them very often, but I may slip and put one in there. So the upside down A says for all, and the backwards E is there exists. Um, all right, so again, just like we saw with the plane pi and its corresponding normal line, that the orthogonal complement of a subspace is itself a subspace. And why don't we go ahead and just practice how you show something is a subspace. Let's go ahead and uh, write out a proof that W perp is a subspace. Well, what do we need to show something is a subspace? We need to show two things, that it's closed under vector addition and closed under scalar multiplication. So how do we do that? Well, let's start with closure under vector addition. We're going to take two vectors from uh, w perp u and v. And closure would mean that their sum is also in w perp. All right, well, what does that mean? Well, for u and v to be in w perp, then that means u and v are orthogonal to every vector in w. And so if that's true, we should be able to show that the sum u plus v is also orthogonal to every vector in w. So obviously we can't try every vector in w. We just start with a generic vector w. There's nothing special about it. And if it works for this w, then it works for any other w. And so let's check. Is it orthogonal to w? Is the sum u plus v orthogonal to w? Well, how do we check if two vectors are orthogonal? We look at their dot product. So I'm going to dot the sum u plus v with w. I can now use the properties of the dot product. I can use the distributive property. And then that will be u dotted with w plus v dotted with w. But u and v are orthogonal to every w. So u dotted with w and v dotted with w are both 0. And their sum is 0. So we can conclude that the sum u plus v is orthogonal to any vector w, which means it belongs to w perp. Now let's check the other test, which is we have to show that the subspace w perp is closed, or so the set w perp, because we don't know it's a subspace yet, is closed under scalar multiplication. That means that if you start with any vector in w perp and any real number, we should show that if I take r times v, that also belongs to w perp. You can't scale your way out of w perp. All right, so that means that if we start with v in w perp, v is orthogonal to every vector in w. All we need to show is that rv is also orthogonal to every vector in w. And how do we check if it's uh, orthogonal? Again, we form the dot product to see if it's 0. 
and we'll use the properties of dot products. Here is that property we call homogeneity, which says I can factor out the constant r. Inside, I just have v dotted with w, which we know is 0 because v is orthogonal to w. And of course, r times 0 is 0. So now we have verified that rv is orthogonal to w, which means rv belongs to w perp. Now, since w perp is closed under vector addition and scalar multiplication, we can conclude it is a subspace. <coughs> We've been talking about R3, but things are even simpler in R2. If I start with a subspace in R2, which would be a line passing through the origin, what would be its orthogonal complement? Well, it would be another line passing through the origin, which is perpendicular or orthogonal to the original line. So orthogonal complements in R2 are very simple as well. Now, um, Suppose that I have a spanning set for w. If I want to see if a vector v belongs to w perp, I just have to check it against all the vectors in the spanning set. So formally, we say if w is spanned by k vectors, w1 through wk, uh, then anything that's in the orthogonal complement is going to be orthogonal to all of those vectors. And so if I could just have those k vectors form the dot product set it equal to 0, then I could actually uh, come up with a characterization of the, of the orthogonal complement. And what do I mean by that? Well, let's look at a characterization would be a basis for the orthogonal complement. So here I'm giving a, a, a space, actually a set, in R4, it's a spanning set for W, and uh, I'd like to find a basis for the orthogonal complement of W. Well, let's think about that. Any vector which belongs to W perp is going to be orthogonal to each of those vectors. So in other words, the dot product of X with the first vector and the dot product of X with the second vector would have to equal zero. Well, that's going to give us a system of equations. The first one would say x1 plus 0x2 plus x3 plus 2x4 equals zero. And the second dot product would say 0x1 plus x2 minus x3 plus x4 equals zero. And we know how to solve homogeneous systems. We just need to transform the coefficient matrix to a reduced row echelon form. And uh, this coefficient matrix is already in reduced row echelon form, so no extra steps are needed. Now we just need to find the general solution. Now the general solution is also a basis for the null space of this matrix. And we learned how to uh, sight read that, so let's go through that. We have x1 and x2 are leading variables. x3 and x4 are free. And that means I have to have two vectors in the basis of the null space of this matrix. And each vector is going to have four components. That should make sense because we already talked about x1, x2, x3, x4. And we also know that we have to be able to dot each one of these rows with the vector x. So corresponding to x3, because it's x3, we'll have a positive 1 in the third component, because it's x3. The first two components I read from the third column. I just have to change their sign. So I'd have a negative 1 and a positive 1 as the first two components, 1 in the third component, and then 0 anywhere else, which is the fourth component here. And for the vector corresponding to x4, now I'm going to have a 1 in the fourth component. The third component will be 0. And the first two components, I just have to change the sign of the entries in column 4. So it would be negative 2, negative 1, 0, and then 1. And if I ever uh, you know, am concerned, I can always perform the uh, 
check this by go ahead and multiplying this out. And sure enough, if I take negative 2, 1, 0, 1, dot it with 1, 0, 1, negative 2, I'll get 0. And if I dot it with 0, 1, negative 1, 1, I'll get 0 as well. And I can do the same thing with the other vector. Now, if this sight reading is not clear to you, uh, then you don't have to do it. You can always go back and use our par parameters. I need, I need two parameters. I'll use R and T. And then find the general solution to that homogeneous system. Write it as two, the linear combination of two vectors. And so those vectors then would be my basis vectors. And in either case, you get your uh, basis vectors for W perp. So we saw that the, uh, the way that we found a basis for W perp in the previous example was to find the null space of a matrix. And so uh, let's examine that uh, null space connection a little bit more clear. So first we're going to re revisit our idea of uh, matrix vector multiplication. Uh, we talked about this previously. We said that most of the time, almost always, it's useful to consider uh, matrix vector multiplication, the result from matrix vector multiplication, as a linear combination of the columns of A. That column view is going to serve us well in many, many instances. However, we could also look at it as um, through a row uh, point of view, a row-centric point of view, meaning the matrix vector multiplication. So we'll start by just writing A as a, a set of row vectors, and then matrix vector multiplication would just be, uh, the product would be determined by taking each row and dotting it with the vector X. So we would wind up with a vector of dot products, one for each row. So just to be clear, uh, let's just work out a simple example here. Here I have A with uh, three rows, and I color-coded them to distinguish them. Our vector X is just 8, 9. So if I want to multiply A times X, uh, then I would take the dot product of 2, 1 with 8, 9. That would be my first component in the solution. And then the dot product of 1, 5 with 8, 9 would give me my second component. That comes from the second row. And then the third row dotted with 8, 9 gives me the third component of the solution. So the null space of A then, another way of thinking of, of the null space of A, uh, is that a vector belongs to the null space if and only if it's orthogonal to all of the rows of A. So now we, we can uh, say that, oh, you're a solution to the homogeneous equation if and only if that vector x is orthogonal to each row. So let's state this in three different ways. So x belongs to the null space of A if and only if it's orthogonal to all the rows of A. That would mean that x is in the null space of A if and only if x is orthogonal to the row space of A. Remember, if you're orthogonal to every row, then you're going to be orthogonal to the span of those rows, and the span of the rows is the row space of A. Which would mean that if x is in the null space of A, then it belongs to the orthogonal complement to the row space of A. So we saw that the row space of A is the orthogonal complement of the null space of A. If I let W be the row space, W perp is the null space. And there are always, we should always be careful. I should always say that they're orthogonal complements of each other. Uh, the orthogonal complement of the null space is the row space. The orthogonal complement of the row space is the null space. They are orthogonal complements of each other.
So this also gives us a way of finding a basis for w perp, like we did in the example. That works in general. If we are given a spanning set, then we put those spanning vectors as the rows of our matrix A, and then we find a basis for the null space. And remember, finding the basis for the null space entails transforming the matrix to reduced row echelon form and finding the general solution to the homogeneous system of equations. And you're welcome to use sight reading to do that. Here's a little bit of a, a warning. Uh, because we usually write our vectors as, uh, well, in horizontal format, a lot of times uh, people are tempted to just throw them in as rows, but this is the only application in this course, the, the one and only application, where we will put those vectors in as rows. In every other application, the vectors go in as columns of our matrix. All right, so let's do another example. Now, instead of having two vectors, I have four, uh, I'm sorry, five vectors in R4. So we know that right away that the, this cannot be a linearly independent set. Uh, so, but this is still a spanning set. It's going to be a span, the spanning set for our subspace W. We'd like to find a basis for W perp. All right, so what is our first step? Populate the matrix A with the vectors V1 through V5, and then transform it to reduced row echelon form. So I didn't show all the details here, but we should know how to do that. What we can see is that um, there are three leading columns. So corresponding to three leading variables, there's one free variable. So there should be only one vector in the null space of A, uh, meaning one vector in the orthogonal complement, in the basis for the orthogonal complement of W. So let's go ahead and uh, find that uh, vector. We're just going to use sight reading. Again, so this is the third column. So what would I do? Well, I would put a 1 in the third component, change the sign of the first two, and keep zeros in the remaining components. So 1 in the third component. Now I have positive 2 and negative 1, and then 0 elsewhere. Now, even though I have five uh, entries in the column, remember that the vectors in W perp are going to have only four entries because we're supposed to be forming that dot product. All right, so a uh, quick check here. Let me just see if I take two, negative one, one, and zero and dot it with V1, I'll get two minus three is negative one, plus one is zero. With V2, I get two minus four, which is negative two, plus two is zero. Negative 2 plus 1 plus 1, also 0. Uh, 4 minus 7 is negative 3, but plus 3 is 0. And finally, 0 minus 3 plus 3 plus 0 equals 0. So just it's always good to do at least a mental check in these situations. All right, what are the properties of orthogonal complements? We've mentioned them, but let's go ahead and list them formally. Um, the only vector which belongs to W and W perp uh, belongs to both of them is the zero vector. Again, when we're thinking orthogonal complements, we should always go back to the picture of a plane passing through the origin and the normal line. What is the only point that those two objects have in common? That's the origin. And so it makes sense that uh, any vector that, uh, since zero, the zero vector is perpendicular to any vector, that it would belong to both W and W perp. And of course, they're both subspaces, so both of them have to contain the zero vector. All right, the orthogonal complement of W perp is W. In other words, W perp and W are orthogonal complements of each other. So W perp perp would be W. 
All right, and so since w perp together with w complete rn, it makes sense that if I took the dimension of w and added the dimension of w perp, I would get the size of the space. Again, the dimension of the plane is 2. The dimension of the line is 1. Add them together, and I get 3, the whole R3 space. All right, so let's finish up here with uh, a new idea related to uh, our uh, work that we've just gone through. And it has to do with checking if a spanning set uh, is also a subspace. So if we want to, we're given a set and we'd like to know, and I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said spanning set, just to check if a set is a basis for a subspace. We need to check two things. Is the set linearly independent and does it span the space? Well, now we have a theorem that will tell us that if we have the correct number of vectors in the set, so in other words, if the number of vectors in the set matches the dimension of the subspace, then we only need to check one of the two. So the formal statement says that if you have a subspace, and we know the dimension of the subspace is k, and then, if I'm given a set of k vectors from the subspace, then I only need to check to determine if w, b is a basis for w. I only need to check if either b is linearly independent or does b span w. So just a quick reminder, checking for linear independence is simple, obviously, for one vector or two vectors. Two vectors are linearly independent, provided that they're not parallel to each other. But if you have more than two vectors, there's no simple test. You really have to check the uh, reduced row echelon form. And again, uh, in almost every other situation, including this one, if you're going to check if three or more vectors are linearly independent, you populate a matrix columns with those vectors, and then transform it to reduce row echelon form. So I hope you found this video on orthogonal complements useful. We will be referring to orthogonal complements throughout the course.